I'll preface my remarks, too, by saying I've been there for three months full time. Um, so this is really the beginning of um, this process, and I, I think uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to talk to you as a group today about some of our thoughts and, and challenges. So who is Mission Health? Well, we're a large uh, nonprofit rural health system in Western North Carolina. This is the flagship hospital here in uh, Asheville. The health system really covers 19 counties um, throughout Western North Carolina. Um, and this, this is the state of North Carolina. And so we're really, uh, catchment is the, these 19 counties, a very rural area, but about a million people uh, we service in those counties. Obviously, right across the mountains is Tennessee, and then to the north, Virginia, and to the south, South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, Mission Health System um, is made up of a flagship hospital. It's a tertiary care regional reference center um, in Asheville. It's a 750-bed hospital. And um, six smaller hospitals are either part of or affiliated in a number of different ways with Mission Health System. These are scattered throughout the mountains um, with an additional 300 beds. Our patient demographic is a largely underserved population, mostly Caucasian throughout this um, area, but it's an extremely stable population. Uh, most people do not move away. They've been living here for generations and generations, and there are opportunities to be following patients for their entire life. Our payer mix, um, as you might expect in a rural environment, uh, we have 75% uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Obviously, um, challenges that I was interested in speaking further to the CMS representative yesterday. Uh, the system is highly uh, rated for quality care. Uh, Truvin, uh, previously Thomson Reuters, um, issued them a top 15 healthcare system for the last two years. Mission Hospital um, has been um, in the top 100 over five consecutive years. They've been in the 95th percentile for hospital value-based purchasing despite their payer mix. And it's one of the busiest uh, surgical hospitals in, in the state. Um, I think currently the vision that the leadership and I have been talking about in bringing a personalized genomic medicine program to this area um, is really to set up an infrastructure for the eventual um, onslaught of genomic medicine, um, including all the things we've talked about here, education, integration of our electronic medical records, integration um, of all the different service areas, and starting out uh, looking at pharmacogenomic testing, drug gene interactions in both germline and somatic um, areas, somatic meaning the tumor areas. I think the future potential is hopefully what we all are here for about personalized genomic medicine is to eventually take a integrated holistic approach where genomic or omic medicine, whatever it might be in the future, is one component of a holistic approach to looking at um, psychosocial, cultural, economic access and wellness issues as we try to coordinate um, and be accountable for care for all our patients. The reason I got recruited there is because there is um, a large support from the senior leadership. Our CEO, Ron Paulus, was the previous director of innovation at Geisinger. Um, Jill Hoggard Green had been at Intermountain Health. And there is quite a large group that I haven't even listed on here who want to see this happen um, at Mission Health. So why should Mission Health want to develop a program like this? Um, well, it is the right thing to do for the community and the patients. I think their philosophy is and has been, it's a new leadership team, that there's a very patient-centered care philosophy, that this will uh, prepare hospitals, clinicians, and patients throughout Western North Carolina for the era of genomic medicine. Um, they want to be able to try to provide quality care locally for their patients. Patients do not like to go elsewhere for care. And it also builds on an existing expertise in molecular genetics. Uh, they have a, a Fullerton Genetics Center at Mission, which um, is really a pretty impressive group of uh, laboratorians and medical geneticists and uh, genetic counselors 
addressing a spectrum of diseases uh, currently targeted in the pediatric population, developmental disorders, autism, et cetera, um, and also having an expert genetics laboratory in which they have very sophisticated um, genetic uh, testing and technology serving not only Western North Carolina, but they get samples in from all over the United States, Europe, and Canada, especially for developmental disorders, and uh, recently uh, brought on um, a MySeq. So it's kind of a little gem uh, tucked away in the mountains, and I think based on this, uh, there was good opportunity to explore um, developing a personalized medicine program. Um, internally, there's a, there's a strong infrastructure. Um, what I'm trying to do, meeting with each of the uh, fundamental units within the hospital, um, pharmacy, pathology, genetics, which has an IT group working with it, and their health information technology group, which has really expanded, and they've put an incredible amount of investment into this area, what I'm trying to do now is get everybody to be talking to each other and looking at this as a whole system rather than just their individual areas. I think um, I've moved from an academic research setting, where I've been for 30 years, into this clinical care setting, and there's a lot of differences, a lot of opportunities, and a lot of challenges in a non-academic health system that I'm just starting to realize. Now, um, you know, we do have this internal, you know, service line within the hospital, and then there's a variety of clinics, uh, not only in Asheville, but spread throughout this large 19-county region. And so there's um, quite a bit of outpatient work that goes on as well as inpatient um, within Mission Hospital. Um, adding to this um, complexity is that the physicians in the area are um, currently in their own private practices, many affiliated with Mission Health System, but they are not employees of the hospital. And so what I've been doing too is going out and talking to the different um, practices to uh, understand their interest um, and knowledge uh, about genomic medicine and the onslaught of some of this information that they've been reading about. And I think my, my overall view in, in trying to develop this appropriate integrated infrastructure it lists all the things that everyone has been talking about and part of the reason why I wanted to come here just to listen is to learn from others who have been trying to do this in a research and a clinical setting, but recognizing that um, all at the same time, many different parts of this infrastructure need to be developed. Um, the aspect of uh, awareness, education, communication, and dissemination of accurate information as well as the ELSI issues. For the healthcare provider at the hospital and throughout the region, for staff, as well as for the patients and families and the public in this area. Having um, opportunities for laboratory testing in-house and some expertise in genomic medicine interpretation and application obviously is, is necessary. Going through the same kinds of uh, concerns, how do we integrate genomic results into the electronic medical record um, and develop clinical decision support tools? Uh, we have a Cerner system. It's for inpatient as well as outpatient. The two systems don't really talk very well to each other. The idea of having apps sitting on top of this would be, uh, I think, a, a feasible way to try to move this in the right direction. Um, concerns about how we archive results that are not reported and monitor those over time for clinical relevance and what the approach and the best approach might be. Obviously, with our payer mix, we're very concerned about CMS reimbursement and level of reimbursement um, for these tests. And uh, after I spoke with our board of directors, who was very excited about doing this, obviously the questions I got were, well, give us a cost-benefit analysis, give us an economic analysis, a return on investment, which I don't haven't done yet because I don't know how to do it, and that's one of the things that um, I, I think are, are challenging in this environment. Obviously, it's not just me. There's a team of people. And also, how to measure impact. Um, what are the metrics for impact? And again, that's 
going to be different in every in every group, um, and looking at how we evaluate the success of a program. Um, what are the right outcome measures to be um, collecting now and be able to compare to measure impact? So I think Moon Curry will be happy to know that I did remember my public health policy planning um, assessment structure. And so I developed you know, different phases of how to, how to look at this um, program. Um, assessment phase, a planning phase, which is what we're in right now, implementation of pilot demonstration projects, evaluation of those projects, and decisions on whether or not this should be expanded and how to expand, et cetera. And this is nothing different than anyone else has been talking about um, doing it in, in a uh, patient-focused environment um, where the, the one goal is quality patient care um, ha has been a, a real opportunity. Um, the assessment phase that I've done, um, I could keep doing it for six or eight more months. I'll never be done with it, but budgets are due, so I need to come to some kind of a closure on this, is really to go around and look at uh, buy-in, um, infrastructure, what's the feasibility of really doing um, a program like this. And I can say overall that there's been considerable support from the clinicians, obviously very much support from the senior leadership, that there is a, a capacity and potential for this infrastructure to really work. Um, and the next step is to try to understand what the kind of demonstration projects that might be appropriate to do. I've proposed a few. Some, I think, are overly enthusiastic. Um, I think I'll find, like the rest of you, that narrowing it down might be better. But there's three uh, proposals for quality improvement initiatives that are being discussed right now. One, in our pharmacy area, the, the pharmacists at Mission are very interested in trying to take a leadership role in this area, especially for looking at inpatient um, pharmacogenomic testing for drugs the few drugs that have the black box FDA warning in the label, um, especially what we want to make sure of is doing some of these for the HLA markers. We do have uh, uh, HIV population. Um, the opportunities here, what's a good part of this is that it goes across service lines for whether it's uh, infectious disease or cardiology or uh, dermatology. Um, the, the challenge is that it goes across service lines, and that's, that's a huge undertaking and may be very overly enthusiastic to try to get several different service lines up to speed um, all at the same time. I think our other uh, pilot project that we're discussing right now in cardiology, you know, has a lot more comfort level with it. Um, we see about 1,200 patients for stent procedures at Mission Hospital a year. So the discussion of, you know, preemptive, preoperative uh, testing for CYP2C19 for clopidogrel response uh, makes sense. We also have a single um, cardiology practice that has its headquarters in Asheville, so it's one group to interact with, and they're um, already under the mission umbrella. Um, there's data that uh, the cardiology practice and through the medical records that we have related to in-house complications, readmissions in 30 days, et cetera, <clears throat> and um, emergency room visits that might be due to cardiac events um, from these patients. Um, other practical questions that we have right now we're not set up to run all these tests we would probably send them to outside labs to do um, what is what would be the reimbursement rate as we did expand this into actual clinical care um, what are the measurements for impact of this demonstration project in terms of diffusion of innovation the adoption rate that goes on changes in practice patterns in terms of choice of and selection of antiplatelet therapy um, how long do we really need to do a project like this with our numbers to actually get to a point of reducing cardiac events because we're doing this kind of testing and, and really measuring risk, risk avoidance or actually getting to the point where we can show reduction in cost of care? The third area um, for a, a pilot uh, project, and these are all considered a quality improvement projects from our quality uh, officer. Um, mission Cancer 
Care is a new um, entity. They just built a new cancer center there last year in 2012. From this 19 county region, there's about 3,000 cancer patients that come through each year. The new cancer center is affiliated with UNC at Chapel Hill, where I um, had spent 20 years. And what I really see, and since cancer is my area, um, I, I'd like to have a uh, demonstration project really to get the different practices, the oncologists as well as the pathologists, on uh, best practices for tumor marking testing. And I think this um, speaks to what Deborah uh, talked about yesterday, not only the oncologists ordering the appropriate tests, but also when a tissue sample comes into pathology from a non-small cell lung cancer to um, ensure that the appropriate tests, EGFR um, sequencing, if it's appropriate to do um, alfusion protein, that there needs to be a, a two-way communication both on the oncologist side and on the pathologist side in terms of roles and responsibilities. Currently, um, I also would like to streamline the process for tumor marker testing currently. Um, each of the different four oncology practices do send these markers out, um, but to different reference labs, and some of the um, markers from the same tissue you know, go to different reference labs. So the ability to be able to compare results across is, is difficult. So to minimize the number of reference labs that we're using, um, and also to offer an integrated lab report where, as you might guess, um, instead of sending out uh, a new lab result every other day to the clinician to have an integrated report. Obviously, this would be much more feasible doing testing in-house, which is part of the long-range plan. So where am I? I'm in this planning phase of planning for, planning for the demonstration projects, planning for their implementation, their study design, the evaluation of these projects, uh, which ones to prioritize, uh, likely cardiology and oncology will um, be rolled out. Um, they want to see this done, you know, in a in a relatively short period of time. I'm being asked for budgets, um, and I'm not yet done with my assessment. But I think we're all at that that same time. I think what's pushing this is, unfortunately, in North Carolina, they decided not to expand Medicaid. Um, that's where a lot of the the opportunity for funding was going to um, come from. So we really need to be looking at um, budgets and overall planning. Um, for short and long term for a genomic medicine program. So um, Terry asked me what the challenges were in implementation. Well, I haven't implemented it, so I don't know what they are yet. But in thinking through what that might be and taking the list that um, she wrote up in the, in the paper that was in Genetic and Medicine, um, I have a column that says I think I have it covered in terms of how we're thinking about it. We, we certainly have institutional acceptance. I think we have clinician ac acceptance, at least for the ones that I've interacted with so far. We have a plan for clinician understanding, training, education, partnering with NICHPEG and genetic counselors to really have a large um, training program, an ongoing training program. We do have access and expertise in um, genomic medicine testing and applications. I think the, the, some of the challenging areas that um, I'm facing, I mean, all these are challenging for, for me right now, um, are uh, looking at you know, conflicting interpretations of benefit and value and what the framework is to look at benefit and value across different service lines and across um, the system. Certainly, like everyone else, integration of these results into the electronic medical record, I think, is, is doable with clinical decision support. I've been going around and visiting some of the sites that are at least close to me in Tennessee, um, St. Jude's and at Vanderbilt, to, to see that some of that is, um, can be rolled out. Um, how much of that can be transferred and translated into our community setting um, is something to uh, be addressing right now. I think we have a, a, a large way to go to try to um, educate um, the, our patient population and families and the public in Western North Carolina so that we don't oversell versus undersell, as well as provide communication tools for the physicians in terms of how to interact and discuss uh, these tests and the results. Um, 
I think for, for our group, one of the biggest challenges that, that I face is in um, trying to estimate what the reimbursement rates would be, trying to estimate um, return on investment, if we can even do that. I mean, the board of directors wants to see numbers. They want to see this done, but they're also used to seeing some numbers. Um, is a cost-benefit analysis the way to go? Is a cost-minimization analysis? Um, I think those are those are large questions that um, I don't think any any of us have really have a, a handle on. Maybe in a smaller group like Mission, it may be possible to try to develop um, some models that might be appropriate. Um, on the ground, the same practical challenges that everyone else has been facing. How, how really are we going to vet new gene drug interactions? Um, I, I've been relying on CPIC. I'm part of that committee. It's been a great um, effort. Whether that will continue to go on, um, opportunities to interact with other efforts that are going on at NHGRI and throughout the rest of NIH. You know, and you know, having another expert advisory council that everyone else has too. Um, are we replicating too many efforts, or are there opportunities to um, integrate our efforts as well? Um, what is the best process to archive data and monitor, monitor actionability and bring that over into the medical record? What is the best strategy for this group for preemptive testing? How preemptive should that be? The primary care docs in the area, there's a very strong AHEC. They want to start doing some of this testing. They follow these patients throughout their lives. Is, you know, are, are they going to be offering, you know, testing when someone just walks in the door? Or, which I don't think we could handle, uh, nor could anyone afford, um, or to apply some of the high risk models in terms of patient characteristics that we can predict um, with, with some. Um, uh, with not too much effort in terms of which patients might be developing conditions and have procedures that would be um, amenable to pharmacogenomic uh, testing. Um, our our in-house laboratory has the capacity, um, but whether or not that's going to be cost and time effective, I mean, our turnaround time would be probably very good in-house, and they know that their quality of care and their quality and quality controls are um, very well um, set up in the lab, sending it to another lab, just like everyone else, we, we don't know. Um, I think I'm, I'm also in this, uh, this timing and transition of going from genotyping to genome sequencing um, in terms of trying to estimate what's that impact in the clinical arena, what's that impact in um, cost as well as integration into the electronic medical record. And I think what I'm looking for, too, is um, models and metrics for economic analysis and impact. And I really want to hear from anyone who's um, looking at this and wanting to uh, partner in terms of just making sure that we're collecting the right data now so that we can also measure impact um, later on. So I'll just say that it takes a village with partners, big brothers, big sisters. Um, uh, I'm here to learn from others. I know we talk about lessons learned and common threads, and I think that, that we are getting to that um, time frame now where some of these lessons learned could be applied and trying to understand the strategies for expanding programs like this and sustaining them, and whether we should be continuing to look at distinct diseases and distinct treatments versus pathways and systems, which seem to be the direction that we're going or want to go, at least in the, in the cancer arena, and I think through pharmacogenomics, too, it, it, it lays that landscape. And to also, as we're trying to develop our electronic medical record systems and our HIT, to not lose sight of where we may want to be down the road. And, and I put on here a rapid learning systems to be able to use our electronic medical record to abstract information from that to add to a knowledge base where we're learning from daily clinical experience. And I want to see that happening to some degree in our area now so that we can be a participant in these rapid learning systems that I think are, are really taking off. So I'll end here and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. I have our Mission Health aim up, up here which really goes hand in hand with genomic and personalized medicine. So questions, comments, I know I'm 
the last thing between you and coffee and donuts out there. All right, so. thanks very much. <clears throat> Questions? Hi, thanks for the uh, great talk. You mentioned um, you know, being in a small rural, uh, in a rural setting, some of these doctors follow their patients throughout their lives. Can you comment on, you know, on like incidental findings or basically uh, who they might, like what would be the propensity of these doctors to share those results with the family members of these patients since they might know them? Um, if you could just comment on that. Yeah, I think that, that because there's such a relationship that's developed between the providers and the patients in the area, they're, they're, it's a really tight community, not only of, of providers and patients, but between providers too. And so there is, um, many of the docs know each other's patients and families, and many of the families you know, have great trust in, in, their, in their doctors. So I think it provides for an opportunity to have more um, at-risk family member testing. It follows the model that they've used in genetics, and certainly that has worked well throughout the region. I also think that the physicians, especially the primary care physicians and the other um, providers as well, would look towards the genomic medicine team or the personalized medicine team at Mission as part of an opportunity as a bridge um, for consultation services, similar but not as similar as what we have in genetic counseling, but that kind of a, I can't know everything, I haven't been trained to the level where I'm really that comfortable, can you help me as part of a consultation service? And I, I'm, I think that that's part of what our genomic medicine group at Mission is there to provide as an interdisciplinary group of, of people. Jeff. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, congratulations to you and, and to Mission for having this vision for um, community-based um, medicine. Uh, I, I think it's a welcome addition to this group. And also, um, I get the impression from what you say, be, because one, your leadership is committed to this, two, that you're there, um, and it sounds like you have engagement of the practicing community that you may have some more nimbleness and flexibility than some of the um, sort of other institutions that are around the table and doing things. So we might really learn a lot from you about implementation that we have been struggling to do in systems like, like Duke or other uh, mm -hmm. academic centers that have a number of um, uh, functional problems, I'll just call it that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I, I, I agree, and I think that, you know, part of it is that it is a smaller group and there's less complexity. There's not this whole other academic uh, research part, um, and that's what I'm, I'm hoping for as well. So I think it would be a great two-way street. I'd love to learn from you, and if we can um, be there to try to understand what's happening in a community setting, um, and to help that be successful uh, and to define what that really means. Too. So one quick recommendation um, is that yesterday from Carolyn Clancy we heard about the practice-based research networks, community-based mm -hmm. uh, practices, and um, at least uh, one other um, such as uh, community hospital like Mission sounds like El Camino mm -hmm. is one of those uh, that is really trying to break into this space. So the one thing to think about is whether you might coalesce around other similar types of institutions and organizations that have problems that are much more, or challenges that are similar to yours, to coalesce and become more organized uh, in this area. Yeah, actually there is a genomic medicine consortium made up of community hospitals who are interested in, in rolling this out, and I actually contacted Lynn Dowling at El Camino, and you know, she said, wow, you could do this at your hospital? You know, and I'm like, oh, business model, here we go. Um, so I, I think there, there is that opportunity um, but I think having, having a partner, having some big brothers or big sisters too, um, because I think we're, we're all have different uh, levels of comfort of how to roll this out and um, really don't want to reinvent the wheel. And it just seems like so many of our issues are similar in concept, they may not be similar in implementation. Yeah, congratulations uh, again. Um, this is Urban Bottinger from Mount Sinai in New York, and we have engaged with a large community health network in an urban environment in New York City, the Institute for Family Health. And it is uh, reassuring and refreshing to see that the sentiments that you pick up in your environment uh, of the strong bond between the primary care provider who is in the trenches in the community health center 
uh, and the patients. That that is something that we need to bring into the equation as we think about how to deliver genomic information in a complex disorder risk prevention type uh, mm -hmm. setting. And uh, so that is something that was clearly voiced very strongly by the primary care providers that we are interacting with, and it's it's very. Uh, interesting to hear your mm -hmm. uh, uh, finding very similar uh, issues, and that's something we really need should expand on and see how we can uh, really turn this into a positive force. Right, and I think with the, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how many medical homes are actually going to be developing and are coordinating and accountability of care, but that may lend to that type of relationship even in populations where it's not this stable, you know, kind of small town interaction um, that will <coughs> remain to be seen. All right, I think we uh, need to take our break now. We'll take a 15 minute break and reconvene at 11.05. Yeah, yeah. It's challenging. Uh, it is. <laughs>